Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Mike Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. And joining me is a name you might be familiar with if you follow Robbinsdale Armstrong girls basketball. And if you haven't, uh, this could be a name you hear about in Division One in the coming years. And I say that because Savannah McGowan, our guest this week, verbally announced her commitment to play Division I women's basketball at Illinois State. We say verbal because she can't sign the NLI just yet, but that being said, I'm sure this has been an exciting week and a lot of congratulatory texts and things. So Savannah, thanks for coming on. And I guess we'll start with that. What has been the reaction since you made the announcement that you were going to chart a course in Division One women's basketball? A um, lot of lot of excitement. Uh, a lot of yeah, like you said, congratulations, Tex, and everyone's been really happy for me and know how hard I've I've worked. Um, my parents were a little sad when going out of state, but they're <laughs> they're super happy for me. Um, a lot of teachers were super super excited, and I mean I, I can't wait. I'm super excited. What do you think this? could do to build a profile because Robbinsdale Armstrong, they didn't have the best season in terms of record last year. So in basketball circles, maybe you and Armstrong aren't as familiar as Hopkins and Wyzetta and St. Michael Aberville, some of the perennials. So what do you think your presence does to put a spotlight on yourself and the program? Um, I think it kind of is, can be inspiring because I feel like it's social media has a lot to do with um, Hopkins and those other schools that are known around here with that. It seems like they're the only ones who go D1. Um, I think it, it shows that that's not the case at all. Um, any Anyone can really. And I hope this inspires more girls, including at the youth levels, which is what we need to continue playing in our program. A lot of times we, we lose those girls and sometimes key players. So I hope that this, this wants, this continues to show that, that they can continue playing, that they, if they put in the right work, we can build a stronger program. And we, and we have just this past year, stronger than past years. So I'm hoping it influence others to continue playing and working on their game. And I'm punching up some of the numbers here. It's been a while since we've done a Zoom podcast. So if you're not familiar, I have two monitors so I can do a little bit of uh, cheating, so to speak. But to illustrate Savannah's point, the pandemic shortened season, you went three and 11, which probably is not what you strive for when you go out there this past year, 12 and 16, mm -hmm. and you got through the first round in sections. And like you said, that bar, that list of goals, I imagine you're hoping to aim a little higher next season. But what did you sense was different? You speak of this past year being that stepping stone. How do you think that can spill over into what will be your senior season? Um, well, one, we had a transfer and she's from Champlain and she helped a lot. Um, but also just the chemistry with our team this year, um, we're all one family and that's what made the difference was in past years, it's kind of been clicky and we didn't, we all got along, but we all weren't connected the same as we were this year. And you, we might not be like Hopkins or the best team, but the difference of how we win games is we never give up. There's been games where we're down by 15 and 20 and we've almost won or we do win. That's just the difference with our chemistry of the team. And next year, because it's gonna be the same group of girls because we only lose one senior, I think I think we can push 500 or more. And um, we, we had some up and downs this season, which led us to go 12 for 16, just because we had seven girls at games sometimes with, with COVID. But I think we all, we all know what we want. We understand each other even more. We can really push to just even be better. So I did some research uh, once we set this up, uh, this interview that is, and we talked about this beforehand, but we'll start with 
how you embrace your identity because on your Twitter profile, at least, you mentioned that you are two inches taller than baby giraffes. Now, I don't know if you compare yourself to a giraffe as far as your basketball acumen, but it, it, what it tells me is that you don't shy away from your frame or your body type or who you are. So do does anyone come up to you and go, wait a second, what's the deal behind baby giraffes? Because uh, that, that is a cool fact that baby giraffes average about six <laughs> feet when they're born. Now giraffes get a little taller. I don't think you're going to shoot as high as they are. Uh, I'd be a little worried if that were the case. But how quickly did you embrace your height, who you are, all of that? Um, from a very young age. Um it's kind of just like that all around in my family. Um, I love, I love being tall. It's, I wish I could be taller. It'd be really nice, <laughs> but um, it's my mom, even when she was young, she's always kind of been the one to just be different and be herself. And, and I love that. And I love, I love it when I can just, I, everyone who knows me knows that I don't really care what people think about me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do me, I'm gonna dress how I want, look how I want. I, I love, I love being different. There's no point of, you know, trying to be like everyone else. So um, I love, I love the position that I get to play in basketball. Um, and I love, I love wearing high socks. Some people might think it's really weird because it doesn't look cool, but I think, you know, it's one way again to spot me, spot me out from everyone else when you're watching online. So that's, that's my point, but um no, yeah, just being myself and embracing who I am definitely started, I would say, in middle school. And um, I just, I grew a lot of confidence and I, I'm, I'm really talkative and I'm really loud. So that, that definitely helped. That helped me be an extrovert for sure. Uh, but yeah, I just, I think just because my mom and my sister, they, they definitely, definitely were out there and I wanted to be like that also, so. Yeah, two inches taller than a baby giraffe. If you don't know me, you're gonna be like, why did she put that? If you know me, you're gonna be like, yeah, that that makes sense. I am not in a position to disagree, although when you said you wished you were a few inches taller, I'm going six foot two wasn't enough for you. You wanna what, go to seven feet, two inches? So what, <laughs> what, what's your target range? Man, if I could be six six, that'd be great. <laughs> That, that would be my target range, although I think I'm done. But, you know, you don't know. Some people grow in college. That might happen. You don't know. <laughs> All right. So six foot six. There, there's a friend of mine who had the same wish, even though she's six foot one. She wished she was a few inches taller. And I'm going, OK, well. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. Well, I, I can't. <laughs> I, I'm done as far as my growth is concerned. Physically, that is. Mentally, <laughs> spiritually, uh, we, we never stop learning and growing. Exactly. At least I'd like to think that. Well, something that I ask, and it sounds like it didn't take you long to embrace your body type, but I know for some of my guests who've come on, they have said finding clothes and shoes that fit can be a little difficult. Uh, what was that like in your case? And I asked that in the event that someone else who maybe wants to be the next Savannah McGowan or some other athlete out there who has that tall, lanky, or muscular frame, however you describe it, maybe they might be going through something similar. Yeah. Um, well, when I was younger, I would say I hit women's clothing when I was in third grade. So that was, that was definitely a shock. And I didn't get to wear the cute sparkly stuff that everyone else got to, but um, it's definitely a lot easier to find clothes that actually fit now, American tall. Uh, I have to online order pretty much all my pants, like jeans and stuff. Um, Target, I love Target. They've done a lot better job at making sure stuff fits for taller people, but I would say it's, never really been something that I've been like cautious about. Like I, I never really cared cause I was like, oh, I'm tall, like whatever. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Um, I might probably honestly still wear it, but um, yeah, no, I guess up until I feel like the past few years is when um, 
collar clothing has kind of actually been noticed more like stuff that's like fit but for sure yeah like half my jeans are definitely from old navy um and american tall uh it's pretty much what i wore all last year for online school uh sweats and sweatshirts are just so comfortable but when i'm in school that's a different story then i dress up because i love i love dressing up wearing skirts heels I just, I think it's fun because if you're going to be in school for eight hours, you might as well, you know, try to, try to look cute. So. Fair enough. And I, I can attest Savannah because up until it was safe to attend games and other venues in person, uh, sweatpants often <laughs> comprised my apparel because <laughs> it's like, Hey, when I'm on zoom, people aren't, <laughs> they can't see my pants. So. <laughs> exactly so you know you might wear a nice shirt and then wear some sweats underneath that's okay that's different you know if no one can see it's fine <laughs> at least yeah I, I try to set it up so that people don't see my pants <laughs> <laughs> uh no there's no secret camera system uh, so that is uh, amusing though to hear and you know hey like as you were alluding to, it sounds like it extends to regular school hours where I don't want to say you almost want to draw attention to yourself, but you talk about wearing high socks on the basketball court, wearing heels. And I know some folks might wonder, aren't you tall enough? But you're just like, hey, whatever. <laughs> I'm me and I'm not going anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, I love I do, I do, I'm really honest. I do like attention, but I also, I love to, I love to stand out. And part of me also dressing up is because, you know, I feel like a lot of kids are kind of cautious and, you know, they don't want to be judged, but I'm like, you can just wear what you want. Like, who cares? Like, I hope that kind of just inspires others to, you know, want to, want to dress up and wear what you want to wear. And to your other point about how talkative you are, that gave me an idea for next season. Or if there's a tournament where you're off, I'm going, I could use a color commentator if you wanted <laughs> to do a guest spot for a day. That would be awesome. <laughs> and I wouldn't have to worry about trying to stir a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, uh, I say where people recognize you most is basketball. Do you recall the first moment or memory that got you hooked on the sport? Oh, um, I would say, I mean, I always like played when um, like at parks and stuff, but it was in, it was in second grade and it was just like little house league. And I, I was the tallest shocker, but I would bring up the ball. And I would just get the rebound and just go. And I loved, I love scoring and I still love scoring. But I think at first I was like, okay, this is something for me to do. Like, I love to stay busy. But then it, when more stuff started to be added where it wasn't just me having to score all the time and there's other things that basketball involves and I can do so much more, it kind of just became something that I always wanted, I wanted to do. And you make a lot of friends and you have bonds through the sport, um, people who get it and get your drive. Um, but I would definitely say, yeah, second grade was when I first got hooked on it. And I always, I always wanted to go to practice, always loved playing games. Um, but basketball's kind of just been something I've always known. It's been what my, my parents did, um, cousins, aunts, uncles, and it's just kind of something in our family. And, I never questioned why I was signed up for it. It was just something that I felt like came natural to me. And it's the one sport that I just have always loved. So basketball runs in the family. I have to ask you, in the family scrimmages, if you all go up against each other, uh, who wins out? How does that break down? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That, that definitely depends um, because my mom, I'm taller than my mom, but she's 100% going to dominate me. It doesn't matter. She's going to, she's going to definitely beat me for sure. My dad, um, he's six, seven, um, but my mom is 100%, I think the best out of all of us. But when it comes to being aggressive, 
my sister is going to lock you down on defense. That has always been, been her thing. Um, she got crazy hustle, crazy intensity. And then I just, I'm like the little baby of the group. I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to, y'all are like, they get really competitive. So I'm going to say it's between my sister and my mom. If they're on the same team, good luck. When you say your mother would dominate you, so even if you're the taller one, what does she have? Is there something in her skill set that you're trying to pick up? <laughs> That's a, a pretty interesting assessment. Um, well, there are some roles when I play my mom. I can't, um, she gets as many dribbles as she wants. I don't. Uh, she, <laughs> I can't really guard her, but I can. <laughs> um, that doesn't but, sound like a fair fight. <laughs> you no, know, it, it doesn't, but she's my mom, so she just gets what she wants. <laughs> um, no, but her mid range game, if I'm not really guarding her too closely, if she lets me, um, she's going to knock it down no matter what. Um, and I want to, I want to be able to knock down the mid range game for sure. I like being able to shoot threes, but I think mid range is, um, it can be even a better key spot for me. Well, I've said this a lot when I cover games, we're in the era of stretch fours, post players who can shoot threes. That's where the sport is. So I would think there's more than enough room for you to get that three point shot down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also think if you really wanted to get a sense of where you are as a player, or if your mother really wanted to gauge you, I, I think she should at least let you dribble as much as you'd like, because I know in the high school circuit, there, there's no limit on the number of dribbles you can take. <laughs> exactly. Well, unless I'm posting up, then it's just like a swarm of people. I'm like, I get maybe two dribbles if I'm lucky. Otherwise, it's I, I'm a big believer. And if I'm already low enough, I can just turn and go up. We call it supermaning. But um, I don't I don't really do a lot of a lot of post moves if I don't have to. I think there's no there's no need for it because most of the time I'm, I'm getting double teamed, so I kind of have to be quick. So I'm just saying I'd like to see a scrimmage where you don't have any limits imposed on you because I, I, I sense that it, it's not offering a fair assessment of your development as a basketball athlete, at least in the family circle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I agree. So if you could tell my mom for me that I get as many dribbles as I want, I would love to see how that goes down. So <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. If I get to an Armstrong game next year, we'll, we'll, we'll set it up ahead of time. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, who are the people in the sport of basketball? And this can be anyone, but as you picked it up, sounds like it runs in the family. So no one really had any apprehension, but as you became enamored and involved, who are the players or any other personalities? Who did you look up to as you were growing up? Um, I would say, yeah, definitely multiple. Um, for sure, my my sister and my mom again. Um, my I growing up, growing up, I watched my sister play at Osseo, and um, I was always jealous because I wanted I wanted to be the one playing. Um, and my mom always talks about when, whenever she was playing and it's just kind of inspiring and in how much they both just taught me and done for me to be, a, be a better player and just become even greater. Um, celebrity wise, I would definitely say Michael Jordan, mainly because when I was younger, I believed I would be the first woman to be in the NBA. So I don't, don't think that's going to happen, but that was, that was my goal when I was in elementary school, that I loved his, his drive and how if someone wrote a negative thing about him in an article, he was going to turn that around and get it done. Oh, he didn't hit the most threes next season done. Oh, he doesn't have the most assists next season done, et cetera. He just kept doing it and doing it and proving people wrong. It's just what he did. And that was, that was inspiring. Um, just because, yeah, his, his drive and his determination, I think, is outmatched for sure. Well, he just took everything personally, as you might have <laughs> seen it in The Last Dance. <laughs> but that is an interesting choice because like, that's a player who, whose athletic career, I think, predated your existence. He had retired by the time. Uh, yeah, you weren't even around yet when he was playing. I remember him <laughs> during the tail end of the Bulls dynasty, but... 
That's pretty impressive. Well, I know a lot of these uh, youngsters like yourself know their history, so it's not a huge shock, but again, kind of a surprise when you think about all of the current athletes on the men's and women's side who are making a lasting impression and your top pick is someone you weren't even around to see. (laughs) I mean, when you hear stories and then you can just like even see games of him playing, it's, it's, it's just, I, I think, I love it. I think it's, it's inspiring. He just, I just love how he just proves people wrong. I'd love to do that sometimes. So I, yeah, I don't really have words to describe how much he just inspires me, but he's definitely someone that I, that I look up to of making a difference in the game. So even if you've ruled out a potential stint in the NBA, are you thinking of going into the WNBA at some point? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think I would like mainly want to play um, overseas if I could. I think that'd be really cool. Um, But definitely for a few years, I'm kind of hesitant because I do want to go into my profession kind of right away. Um, but I would, I would love to play overseas if I got the opportunity. So what are your professional aspirations? If you want to start a career after you're done playing? Um, I want to be a teacher. I want to, I want to be a high school teacher. I'm, I'm thinking biology just cause I love, I love science and it's so fun, um, learning about it or maybe environmental teacher or something like that. But I love for sure a science teacher. Well, if that pans out, I'm sure that would give you an opportunity to influence a a younger generation. And who knows, maybe you even take up coaching (laughs) alongside (laughs) it. I know some teachers who are on the coaching staff at various high schools, but you've got a few years before you have to worry about that. So uh, (laughs) I'd say let's enjoy uh, this last year of high school ball and your last season of AAU. Uh, (laughs) And hey, in a few years, maybe the WNBA expands and opens up an opportunity there. So it sounds like uh, whatever you end up doing, you're going to make a difference and influence the younger generation in ways you may not even realize yet. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I I hope so. Um, I love like during the summer when we, um, are working with uh, the younger girls at camp. So I have my group of besties. So that's very important that I always get them. But I love, I love um, helping out at those camps. Oh, my phone just fell. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but um, helping out those camps and just seeing how many girls are are wanting to play basketball, or even if it's just hanging out with friends. I, it just feels so great working with them. Now, is your phone secure? Uh, I'd say that was a pretty um, lovely angle of the ceiling that we got there. <laughs> I, I think so. It should be, um, hopefully, here. So, <laughs> depends on how. I have it leaning up against my iPad, which is dead. So, I was hoping that this would this would look good. <laughs> Or, or, or is that you illustrating your influence in the post where after you're done, whoever's uh, defending you, whoever has to go against you down low, did they just see the ceiling because they can't get around you? Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty much how it always works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's how, how I feel sometimes, even if I fall. They, I go through phases during the year where I will just fall and it's not pretty and it's slow, but it's, it's, it's definitely something, but yeah, no, let's, let's go with the defenders I guarding me. Yeah. When did you sense that your path, your journey in basketball would lead you to this division one opportunity? When did you get that idea that, Hey, I, I got a knack for this. Um, honestly, not till I joined, um, Minnesota Fury just last year. Um, I mean, I had played AAU and stuff, but I never thought honestly that I was going to get um, a D1 offer or really any offer. I didn't really know how that stuff looked. And I, for a while, I thought, oh, well, I'm not social media famous. So 
doesn't really look like it's going to look out too good for me. Um, so I thought, okay, well, let's just see what I can do during high school and get that done. Um, Cause there are some goals that I wanted to, to break myself, but um, yeah, not till I joined Minnesota Fury and Nick right away got calls set up for me. And then I had, and then team, uh, colleges were able to see me play in person in July that really expanded it. And I was like, okay, so this, I do, I do have something going for me. And um, if these coaches love me as much as they say, then I think, I think I can, I think I can play D1. So um, but yeah, once when I joined Minnesota Fury and playing at a higher level, that really expanded my game and it made me work harder and faster for things. So. So last year was your first year with Fury. Mm -hmm. Was that your first year in AAU or is that just your first year with the organization? With the organization. And how did your perspective change as you spoke of not being famous on social media and let's be clear that it's really difficult for a lot of individuals uh, to go viral as they say and you know, even myself i think i only have 2500 followers on twitter and i can point to a, i can point to some folks who have a bigger following than i do in media so even i'm going like all right i still have a ways to go but that's always been my attitude <laughs> i could have the most followers in any social media platform and i'll be going okay how do i <laughs> get <laughs> how do I get better uh so you go through and as you noted at Armstrong you were doing well but the team wasn't performing well necessarily compared to some of the perennials so not a lot of opportunities to get noticed if stat lines and box scores are your thing but when you join Fury and then you notice that scouts and coaches were giving you consideration what did you what do you think that did for you as a player to get recognized even if you're not famous on social media yet um it boosted my confidence a lot more uh I already had a lot of confidence and I definitely felt confident with the way I played but when colleges started noticing me and I felt like um like you know they were really interested in me that kind of just changed my perspective on okay this is actually how it really works it's not about everyone who gets you know notice on social media um and it, it grew my it definitely grew my mindset a lot more that it's not yeah it's not all about the fame and the followers and all that and really any anyone i think anyone can do it um or get to the college level in general so that it boosted um yeah, my confidence a hundred percent, a lot more. Do you expect your social media fame to change now that you're going D1 and you have a little more attention in, headed in your direction? Um, no, not really too much. I wouldn't care for it really either way. I'd be like, oh, okay, sweet. Um, it might boost my ego, which I don't know if I need that any higher honestly um but no i've never really cared for for all that um it's never really been something that yeah i've cared about um paid attention to whoever follows me i guess is whoever follows me and i'll try to follow you back if i notice but that's kind of yeah how i feel about it uh, well i'm just saying that because now that you have that division one commitment locked in you might get a few folks who want to check you out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because like myself you know, we've heard of you but at the same time we're going who is this kid yeah um i mean i think uh i don't even know how to put this but I guess, yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah, I am D1 committed, which feels so great to say, but I've still never thought of me getting more attention besides the fact that my phone was blowing up when I did announce it. Um, that was insane, but no, I, it still never crossed my mind that I would be getting more attention. I just viewed it as, okay, I'm committed. I'm moving on to the next level. What am I gonna be able to do there? And we're having a little fun, of course, uh with all of this, I, I do suspect your following will increase uh, 
a bit more now that you brought this spotlight to yourself and to Armstrong. And I know Minnesota Fury, happy to have you in their ranks. So as you touched on throughout the years, a lot of your work has been in the post and I've seen you've averaged a double double in the last couple of seasons. How have you refined that part of your game to instill the influence that you exert in the post? Um, well, getting double doubles a game, I feel like is, um, it's not, I don't want to say it's not easy, but I feel like it's also kind of like expected of me. Um, especially at my, at my height, I feel like I should, I always feel like I should be doing more. Um, and I want to get more rebounds. I, I do want to score more. I want to get more putbacks. Um, and I've kind of always been someone where like, I want to be a true post. I don't want to be some weird combination of a post and a guard. I've always liked being a true post that, that can shoot and that can knock out things on the, on the outside a bit um, whenever it happens, if I'm on the outside, but I've, yeah, I've always loved, loved being a post and hoping that that, cause you know, colleges especially have kind of just gone away from that side of the game, which is something when I was picking out a school, I had to be kind of cautious about. Cause a lot of them, I feel, I personally feel don't use the post and I've seen it happen even in high school games and AAU games. So I wanted to make sure that I was going to be used and I'm not saying give me the ball every possession, but you know, I'm not going to do all the dirty work for you that I do see some girls having to do. I do love getting rebounds. I do love it. And getting a block if a ref decides to like me that game and not call a foul, but no, I've always felt like um, getting double doubles or trying to get the most rebounds is always, is always something that I feel like I should just personally do and shouldn't be like expected of me, if that makes sense. What do you think goes into a strong post player? Since you average double doubles, it's clear you know how to work the low post and score, get rebounds, all of that. But from your perspective, what makes a good post player? Um, I would say what makes a good post player is, well, for sure, being able to finish with contact. Um, uh, there's a lot of times where you're not going to get calls called for you and all of that, but then also being a good defender. Um, I believe that on the post, there's times that you get tired and I'm not the greatest at it for sure, but I believe that post, you're the communicator for the team. You know, you're most of the time you're sitting in the middle. You need to be talking if there's a screen. You need to be calling if there's a cut or helping your teammates out because they can't see it, but you can't because you're at the bottom. Um, and so that's that's one of the things I believe. And along with finishing, um, being strong and uh I also think, yeah, running the floor, that's something that I definitely know I need to get better at. And if I can help run the floor, I might not get the ball, but that opens up opportunities for my teammates. Some, cause they might be drawn to me. Someone in the corner, if they run their spot might be open, that's a knockdown three. Those are just little things that we need to do instead of, and along with posting up also, I need to be able to post, need to be able to get a really good seal and get low. I struggle with, oftentimes I'm playing someone who's shorter than me, but that still doesn't mean that I, I can't sit down because if I don't, they're often able just to tip the ball and it's not a foul. So those are kind of the things that I believe put a post together. Now, when you run into a situation where your assignment is shorter than you are, it doesn't bring back memories of scrimmaging against your mother, does it? No, no, it doesn't. Unless that person was really strong and was going to throw an elbow, then I might be like, all right, okay. Didn't know my mom was on the court. But most of the time that doesn't happen and the girls are yelling, help, help. And I'm just laughing because I'm like, oh, you're helpless. But, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's... 
I, I see you take a predatory approach in that scenario. It's like, you're <laughs> helpless. Oh, <laughs> I've got you where I want you. Yeah, I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy and nice. This is perfect. I don't really got it so much. It's like, Especially if it's like a little guard. No, it depends. Because some little guards are feisty. And I'm like, what is your deal? But some are just like, I can't do this right now. And I'm like, that's okay. You can honestly leave. And you can just go go get ready for offense so but you know what they probably are seeing you it's like oh i can't back down from this woman so i've got to be feisty <laughs> that that is true um and sometimes sure people get away with a lot of dirty things and it makes me mad because when i try it's tweet tweet file number 52 and i'm like are you kidding me she just did the exact same thing to me down there but I, yeah that's kind of one of the things that does suck about being tall is you have to play the game a lot different um there's a lot more stuff called for you on you not for you on you and you just have to I have, oftentimes I feel like I have to adjust to to the refs a lot of how I'm gonna have to play that game before I get into foul trouble because it, it does happen more than I would like it to so when you see a guard who maybe isn't so feisty or <laughs> as you point someone that that is helpless there what goes through your mind? You're thinking, all right, I know who to attack. I know how to jack up my points and rebounds. I'm just going <laughs> to switch on this woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mind immediately goes, oh, like, I feel really bad for you right now, but I'm going to dominate you. Um, and I'm going to look really good right now. And I feel bad because you're probably going to get yelled at your coach for something that you can't handle, honestly. But thank you for... For attempting, it's just not going to work. Welcome to the big leagues, rookie. <laughs> oh, geez. So whoever you, I guess anyone watching in the Northwest Suburban. Yeah, you're in that conference. So <laughs> anyone watching this or at Illinois State or whoever you get, it's like if you back down against this woman, oh, she, that's going to jack up her confidence and she's going to have some dastardly plan for you it's almost like those stereotypical villains you see in cartoons and films exactly exactly i know oftentimes I'm, on friends okay. i hear a lot about uh don't let it go left don't let it go left and i'm like i'm already here so i'm going left can't stop me so yeah, that's how i feel but if it helps our team score it helps our team score so I'm trying to think how many athletes have you shattered confidence in over the years because they're not ready and going, you probably have destroyed the morale of so many athletes out there. Um, hmm. Man, I don't even know. I feel like oh, I've never been asked that before. Wow. I don't, I don't even know. I just, I just go out there and I just I just try to dominate. And if someone I guess feels a little butt hurt, well, <laughs> sorry, but you got it maybe next game. I, I would just like to think how many dreams have you shattered over the years and how many will you shatter next season? Because if, if they're not ready, if they can't handle you uh before you know it, you're gonna blow them up for 20 and 10 and <laughs> uh, yeah. Um People, people watching this, they're going to get the completely wrong impression about you. I'm worried I may have. <laughs> people don't think I'm some jerk. That's not what I'm going No, to. I'm the jerk, you know, I, I'm yeah. the jerk. <laughs> right. People right. watching this, I'm the jerk. That's why I don't get invited to ESPN or I don't get invited to scrimmages or games. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's exactly what they just think of you, so. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, if you don't know that about me yet, just wait till your teammates until your fury teammates. If you ask them, what can you tell me about this guy? I think that's the first thing they're going to say is he's this big giant jerk. He makes Deadpool look oh tame by God. comparison. Uh -oh. Right. My phone just fell. Again. Okay, we're good. I think. I, I Your phone can't even uh, put up with, with you in the post, apparently. It's just, yeah, no, my phone, I guess, is just sick and tired of me, ready to retire, so. Your phone can't even handle you in the low post. Exactly, exactly. Where, where were we? Now, there were a couple of highlights that I wanted to point out because 
I say this all the time, even if you're not on a team with the best record or the most D1 athletes, if you put in the work, people will notice. Well, that's obvious. Otherwise, you wouldn't be going D1. But this past season, you had a couple of highlights that I think uh, others may not have noticed if they haven't heard of you or followed Armstrong. And so uh, this past season, you, I think, set a new career high with a 34-point game against Spring Lake Park, and you had a few 20-point games this year. So when you get those opportunities to set a new milestone, set a new career high, what do you think that says about your growth and your development? Um, I, I, it, shows, it, it shows a lot. I think it shows how much better I can get, how much how much more I'm still able to grow. And I think that's what colleges see in me the most is how better I will continue to get what aspects of my game are just going to grow and get better and better. Um, and I mean, part of that, like the 34 point game, a lot of that was because I just, I just, my teammates kept feeding me the ball and I only had missed three shots that whole game. Um, and it just, that it's the intensity of the games and when I feel like everyone's bringing something um the, those games that I score a lot it's because we're moving the ball and when we move the ball around it distracts the defenders and that opens up me not being able to get tripled or double teamed and I'm able to score a lot easier and honestly quicker um and so yeah it's it's just games like that where um, I hope we do more consistently next year and we can realize that, but also along with the fact that it doesn't have to be about me. My teammates can go drive and score too. They have the ability to do that. That opens up new opportunities and it's not like, oh, it's about Savannah. It's, it can be about everyone. I thought it was always about you. Well, <laughs> with most things, but you know, I'm willing to share this one, I guess. So <laughs> As you can tell, Savannah, I don't mind having fun with my guests or pretty much anyone else. I try to keep things loose. And well, people get so caught up in points and rankings and records and my attitude. Yeah, of course, I'll go. Yes, I, if <laughs> that has skewered my coverage in a sense. So, yeah, I'll go cover Hopkins or I went to a lot of uh, Eden Prairie or Como Park. So like, yeah, if you're performing well, if you get my attention, I will take notice but I always try to find something fun to share about the players because we can get sometimes so caught up in the stat lines that we forget the purpose of doing it in the first place I think like you said you picked it up as a family sport and I imagine it's still fun for you mm -hmm. 100% I love playing I miss it every time I'm not playing I'm gonna my heart's going to break when AAU ends, <laughs> but even just high school, like I miss playing with my high school team and seeing them all the time. When that comes, are you going to take up another sport just to pass the time? I don't know. I, I don't know what other sports you play at Armstrong, but is well, that going to be your. I, I do. I play volleyball. Um, definitely not the best at it at all. Um, I've learned a lot. Like when I block, I can get blocks because I am tall, but my coach said, you jump when they jump. And then my blocking immediately got better. You think that would click, but I have zero IQ when it comes to volleyball. Um, but I'm just there to also just cheer everyone on. And I, I work my hardest because it might not be in my sport and I might not know what's really going on, but there's other people who are clearly passionate about this. So you just got you just got to do what you got to do. And I, I do throwing um, shot put and discus in the spring to get stronger because there's a lot of lifting. But um, I haven't been there within within a week because we've had a lot of basketball practices and then we had our UAA tournament. So then I was gone for three days of the school days. So I'm going to be back at it next week, but I'm. I'm kind of, I just started this year. It's not a sport that I've always been doing. So I'm learning it as we go. And he says I can make state, which I think is him trying to keep me to keep playing. But <laughs> no, I love, I love the atmosphere of, um, of throwing. And I love, I, I do love volleyball when it, when we get a good run. Well, hey, you never know. 
it's it's fun to have on the resume. I've referenced uh, athletes who qualified or won state in other sports that weren't their primary. So it is a, a fun little nugget to have, but we'll see what happens. Uh, there was another game you're talking about ball movement and all of that, but not only did you get a career high with Spring Lake Park dropping 34, if I'm correct, you also had your first 2020 game, even though it didn't result in a win, you played Osseo, 22 points, 21 rebounds. I don't care who you're playing. I don't care the circumstances. That's impressive to get a 2020 game. And after that game was done, I don't know when you uh, look up stats, but when you realized, hey, I pulled this off a 2020 game, what do you think that did for you as a player? Um... Well, when I saw that, um, I I was like, oh, man, I, that's how many I had. Because in my head, I'm always thinking, oh, I didn't get enough. I didn't get enough. I probably got like six rebounds. That's how I always feel. Because um, you can see the points, but I can't see how many rebounds I got. So I'm like, dang, like, I just want to know. Um, but wow, this is a struggle bus. I'm so sorry you have to deal with me today. Um, okay, we're back. <laughs> is there a... Yeah, where are is there like a maybe is there a something <laughs> there a way we can stabilize it because I, I think this phone is is taking a more of a pounding than any opponent you've had to deal with in the post i think so um hmm well no that'd be an awkward angle um i would have to let me think if I brought up a chair and then I put it on the, if you give me like two minutes, I can prop it up like outside of my room and get a chair that I could sit on and talk to you if that would be better. Or if, if there's a chair or if there's just something, I'm just like, hey, th this phone is uh, not cooperating with us. This phone is being a poor teammate. We, we've, really gotta, we've gotta call a timeout, bring this phone in the huddle. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I know what I can do. Okay. Wait. Okay. Give me like 0.5 seconds. <laughs> this is the joy of live podcasting in zoom form folks. You never know what will happen. And so while we wait for Savannah to come back, oh, <laughs> oh she's still here. I'm <laughs> okay. That she's still, might, here. still here. That might work. And then if I, okay. Is wait. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Because now this should stay because this is where all you now you're on all my hair stuff. So okay. I think that works and we can still hear you. I was just gonna go into my promotional rant. Anyway, we were talking about this 2020 game of yours. And so I, I think you sell yourself a little short when it comes to rebounds because I'm looking at this. And so I'm thinking, okay, so games where she had like 15, 16 rebounds, she probably thought she got four. Yeah, because the game goes by so fast, and I never, I never, well, I never keep track, but um, sometimes I feel like I get on a run where I'm getting rebounds, and then I feel like there's, like, four possessions where I'm like, why did I, like, I should have gotten that. Um, like, I don't know, I, I don't know, but I feel like the game goes so fast for me that, to me, yeah, it always feels like I'm getting, I'm getting four rebounds, and in that Osseo game, um, makes me upset because we should have really won that game. We went on like the, a dry streak and that was a team that I know we could have beat because we beat them by 20 previously. And we don't always beat teams by 20, but we just, it was a weird game, not to blame on the refs, but it was the refs fault. Um, and <laughs> I think that it's just something that we just have to come back from and we're ready. We're ready to give our all when we got it. I was going to say, when you see a 2020 game like that, what do you think that says about your progression as a player where you are, can put yourself in a position to put up big numbers like that and really influence the paint, even if you only felt that you had five rebounds and find out, oh, I got 21. But I'm guessing for you, you're just used to scooping up boards but still that that's a 
pretty impressive accomplishment. Again, I don't care what the result is or what the outcome is. A 2020 game is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah. Um, well, I think what that does just during the game um, is, you know, if teams are talking during halftime, like, hey, we got to we gotta find a way to stop her, yada, yada, yada. Um, like I said before, that opens up opportunities for my for my teammates. That's what should happen. Um, I should create chaos for the other teams where they're so drawn to me. Perfect. Now let's focus on our outside girls and they can knock down shots, they can drive, and then they can contribute. Because I, I did I did my part of making sure that I hope that opportunities come from them. Because most of the time in these high school games, um, I think teams are looking as, at me as their threat. And that's fine because I do, I do have girls on my team who can score, who can knock down shots. And if you want to focus on me, leave the other girls open, that's your problem. Well, I would consider you a threat the way you strategize or the way you come up with these dastardly plans if you sense a weaker defender coming your way. I mean, I, I, I could understand that. Oh, yeah. Especially if I, if I know I got someone weak on me, I am. I am screaming for the ball. Like, look at me. Like, first of all, I'm six two. Look at me. Second of all, look, you can't even see the girl behind me. Another reason to give me the ball. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I if I know I have it, I'm for sure going to I'm for sure going to try to scream for it because there's not often times where it is just me in the other post. And that's where I'm like, I want the ball now. I'm just saying the way you pounce on helpless defenders on offense, uh, I think it is uh, justifiable that uh, opposing coaches see you as a threat. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, I definitely think so, especially when I can hear their coach just yelling the whole time. I'm like, oh my gosh, calm down. I wouldn't be surprised if if. if Coaches and players, you might be responsible for several therapy sessions before you're through, Savannah. That might be true. I do have a little thing where if, if you hurt my teammate and if you're driving in on me, don't expect it to be easy. Um, it might be, might be a little rough. I'm not saying I did it on purpose. Just don't mess up. Because, you know, if you're running into a brick wall, so it's not going to be fun. And, you know, you might I'll call for you because that's just what refs do. But if you choose to run into a brick wall and you think it's going to move, good luck. Well, I, I'm not courageous enough to find out for myself. And I also don't want to get uh, expelled from any Armstrong games next season. So uh, you won't have to worry about me charging you at full speed. I, I think I would just bounce off because I <laughs> don't have the most imposing frame. <laughs> You mentioned some of the goals, maybe getting above 500, perhaps making a deeper run in sections, but with all that you've accomplished to this point, you know, what are you excited about as you continue your final season in AAU? You've got the Division I offer locked in. It's clear that you can hang with the best of them, as we've seen. You, know, you play for the top Fury 2023 team, a group that I think has Kennedy Sanders in their ranks. And oh, I forget who else is there. That's the thing. When you cover AAU, you have so many names to keep track of that it all becomes a blur, especially once you get to the high school season. Mm -hmm. So what are you excited about as you continue this last chapter of your club and high school journey? And what do you think your successes to this point can tell others who maybe they don't play for a Hopkins or maybe they don't play for a team that makes state or wins it seemingly every year. But as I think you've seen with memes or as some college coaches have put it, if you're good enough, people will notice. Yeah. Um, well, what I'm most excited for is I'm, I'm excited just to ball out with the team for AU and um, see everyone else commit on my team and see where they're going to go and what they're going to do. Um, I love my, I love my fear team. Some of the best teammates ever. Uh, 
and I, we just all we all get each other and we all we all laugh and I I love them so much um and realistically if the season could never end I wish that's how it could be um but with high school I'm ready to yeah push for 500 or more um I'm ready to compete ready to get after it um maybe maybe break some records and just just show that um we, how much we have grown especially since my freshman year and hopefully that can continue um especially yeah for girls who don't think that they can do it you really can if you want to it's just a matter of are you going to push yourself because not everyone there is there to push you so are you are you willing to get better um are you willing to do the little things? Because like I said, we're not the best team, but the reason why we had such a growth this year is because we learned how to do the little things and the games that were necessary. And we continue to grow throughout the season. So I know that we can grow throughout the next upcoming year. And I'm, I'm excited for that. And I had to remind myself, I did look up your Fury roster and I'm going, okay, I can see why you're excited to play alongside uh some of these ballers, uh, I can't wait to uh, see all of you in action. I had kind of a slow start on my end. Uh, like I said, though, I think there's a lot of room for growth on your end. And so with what you accomplished last season, Savannah, I'm expecting a 30-30 game from you since you've scored 30 points before, you you had a 20 rebound game. I'd like to see a 30-30 before you're through. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'll keep that in, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Just stomp out any morale, any hope whatsoever. So if you see a helpless defender, that's your opportunity to get that 30-30 game and just completely <laughs> dominate and make anyone think twice about going up against that brick wall. Exactly, yeah. If anyone has, if, if I see like a little slither of hope in their eyes, it's going to get crushed. <laughs> That's what it takes to get 30-30. Because as we've, as I've learned from this conversation with you, you are the destroyer of dreams, apparently. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. I, I have to imagine your conference rivals and everyone else are probably will be happy that you're going away to Illinois State after this next season. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, uh, they'll have to find someone else to yell at. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think teams are getting tired of me. Next year will be my sixth year with the team. So I think they're ready for me to finally leave. And my coach can can finally have a, a new roster after being with the same group of girls for a while. Well, I have a feeling your coaches are going to be a little sad for that. You know what? I told him he's on and he keeps saying no. So I don't, I don't know. I think he will. He's just being a little hard on himself. So. I was going to say, what was he saying there? He said, yeah, he's just not going to, not going to cry when I'm gone. But I just, I just don't think that's going to happen. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's me we're talking about. So I, I just feel like there's going to be a lot of tears. I was going to say, it, it, your coach might not shed a tear, but I think your parents and teammates will. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. My parents, yes. <laughs> And I know I will be bawling my eyes out because I, I love both groups of my teams so much. Well, if Kennedy Sanders is one of your teammates, I could see that. I mean, you have one of the craftiest and most elusive point guards I have ever seen. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, she is. She is so amazing. And, you know, I used to think when I first joined the team, I was like, gosh, she really hates me. But that's just her <laughs> game face look. She, what that's how she is and she is she's like the one of the best point guards ever just to exist i'm like i don't i'm running down the court and i'm like girl i need you to pick a side because i don't know where to run and i know you're gonna go up her left make it either way so you tell me what's how to go and i'm gonna do that and then you can go up and score but she is she is so sweet and so funny and i, I do love her she is really awesome I was going to say, Savannah, she didn't have to go up against you in a practice. So she didn't have to try to bust down that brick wall that you put up, did she? That might be, I mean, if that were the case, I could see why she'd hate you, but. 
Um, well, you know what? I remember just even like playing her. Um, if I had to like go and help side and she was going to go up against me, um, I knew that she was going to pass it. Um, and her passes are also just so insane and so quick because I'm like, okay, she's going to score this time and then she passes it. She's going to score this time and then she passes it. And yeah, her her eye of the court, her view is is phenomenal, I think. Um, but no, she is, I don't think she's really had to had too much of going up against the brick wall yet, so. As, all right, as long as we got that out of the way, because I'm going, why would anyone hate you? I mean, they might feel a bit salty if they got stopped in the tracks, but <laughs> I think you made it clear that you don't take it that personally. No, no, never. So there are a few things I like to touch on in these podcasts. Actually, there is a biographical note that I discovered uh, looking through you know, profiles and the Breakdown book. I'm an annual subscriber to the Breakdown Guide book. And this facet, if this is still true, this fact surprised me because, again, it goes back to you weren't even around yet when it was first in existence, but apparently you are a big fan of the Golden Girls. Oh my gosh, it's my favorite show. I own all seven seasons. And I'm going, <laughs> how the heck does that happen? Because like some parents or at least some parents of future kids are going, that show debuted in 85. So like folks, uh, <laughs> We're talking about your parents were probably around your age. It may be a little older, but I'm thinking, <laughs> how how did you discover that show? Because <laughs> you weren't even you weren't even a thought yet in its original run. Well, it all started when I was in elementary school, and if my parents both worked in the morning, then that was great because I could watch TV before I leave for the bus. And my brother was still sleeping. So while he was sleeping, I would just turn on the TV to TV Island. And there was the Golden Girls. And I remember, I don't know why I just loved the show so much. And I thought it was really funny. And that was like my go-to show. And um, now I watch it on Hulu or on my DVDs. And it's it's my happy show. It's It's definitely my favorite show. And I love the friendships between them and... It just, it's just my favorite show. So I'm wondering, Savannah, are there any other old school athletes or TV shows or films that you uh, have a fandom in that we should know about? Because I'm impressed at your knowledge of what would, what would be considered my generation or before. Michael Jordan, the Golden Girls, I'm going, I feel like I'm in a time warp here. Well, my favorite artist is Whitney Houston. Um, that is just, I feel like should be everyone's favorite artist. My favorite like band singer group is ABBA. I love them so much. Um, I also watch The Facts of Life, Good Times, um, French, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which I feel like most people have watched. Um, Three's Company, I like that show. Um, those are all the ones I can think about that I've watched, but I've definitely, if someone was like, oh, you should watch this show. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I normally end up liking it. Um, it's yeah. I just, I guess you could say, yeah, I definitely like a lot of things that were, that were older, but <laughs> kind of, it's totally not like my parents influence. It's just something that I've stumbled upon I kind of, as I go. <sighs> So you have this collection, I'm going, your fandom extends to the pre-HD era, and I'm thinking, how do your parents, how do they respond to it? Because a lot of these shows you listed, again, were around when they were growing up. So for your parents, I remember when even when I was in high school and uh, some of us were into what they call the old school acts and there were colleagues and writers going, how is it that you're into this music uh, that existed when we were around? 
Um, my parents, they they love it. Um they've never really commented on like why or how I like it. They just they just love the fact that I just love it. I think they just like that there's someone that likes stuff from when they were young. So you have perhaps the most interesting assortment of music and television shows that I have heard of among all the athletes I've interviewed on this podcast, because oftentimes I'm having to brush up on the modern references. And here you are, like with all these older shows, I'm going, what the, like, I feel like I'm reliving my childhood or at least part of it. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a lot of people's like, first thought is like, how does she even, but like I said, if you know me, you don't question it. You're like, that just makes sense. If you don't know me, you're like, how the heck? But then you learn and you're like, okay, that makes sense now. Well, I have a feeling over time, th this will make more sense to me because this is the first time we've really had any face-to-face -face conversation. So you're right. I'm kind of going though. That is a highly unusual choice for someone of your age but if that's what you're into I mean there, there are worse habits to have so it, it, I, I'm fine with you having your favorite television programs all come before HD was a thing and 4k and all of that well you know what another I guess newer show that I do love is American Horror Story and I don't like scary things but I can do that or Criminal Minds I love true true crime or yeah uh, crime shows so, but I normally don't say, oh, that's the person that comes to my head. The person that comes to my head is the Golden Girls. I will say, I can't say I've seen all seven seasons of the Golden Girls, but it, it did give me a, a rather amusing moment that I looked back on a couple of years ago after Alex Trebek died because uh, Jeopardy, that was a popular thing at the for shows of that era was to feature uh, game shows or to have their characters go on game shows and make that part of the plot and so in the seventh season uh there was an episode i think yes where dorothy dreams of going on jeopardy uh be arthur's character and the way they played it out i found it amusing because in my head i'm going this is what jeopardy would look like if it were allowed to be 10 percent snarkier <laughs> i know exactly what episode you're talking about <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, because that's such a good episode. Okay, sorry. Um, no, yeah, I 100% agree. I love that episode, actually. I feel like that's from the fourth season? It was the, se it was the seventh season, and I oh. only know of this because of the set design. Jeopardy had just redone, they had actually had renovated their set for the first time and so <laughs> this is uh, all right this is my weird and unusual fun fact about myself i can recognize certain eras of shows based on either their uh, graphic templates so the the font they use or the set design and because game shows typically stick with the same set for several years you're like oh i know when this was around <laughs> and i recognize the metal grid set from that era, so with uh, cross-referencing it, they redid their set in 91, and the last season of The Golden Girls was 91-92. Oh. How, how unusual, how weird is that? <laughs> I guess I never question it in my head. I'm like, oh, well, who doesn't know The Golden Girls? But one of my teammates um, who, you know, we carpool like every practice together, really had the audacity to ask me if that was like a song or like a book. And I literally, all my teammates were like, why would you ask her that? Why would you say that? And I was like, you're lucky we're screaming my head off. As I'm wearing Golden Girl socks, keep in mind, okay? That's how, that's how that got brought up. And she really had the audacity to ask me that. And I felt so disrespected, so. I almost cut you off there because I'm trying not to laugh, but I'm thinking it's like your teammates are like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Uh, actually, I'm going, that theme song, you may or may not know this, that theme song was actually a cover. I do know that. 
Yeah. In fact, the Golden Girls, um, like the cover one is uh, my ringtone. Okay, I was going to say, so you knew it was a cover from a 70s pop song that got reworked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I prefer the girls version more, but that one's also good. And I will say I did uh, enjoy the reference when Betty White hosted her solo, her one time on SNL, which they re-ran shortly after her death, and uh, which to me was emblematic of who she was, just this uh, this comic actress who wasn't afraid to have fun with herself or pretty much anything or anyone. Yeah. She was probably like the best person to ever exist. Just aside from, you know, my mom and all those important people, but she was. <laughs> all those important people. <laughs> no, but uh, anyways, that's irrelevant, but yeah, no, she is like the best person ever. Well, and thanks to her, you probably know all about her character's backstory, the Golden Girls, and I didn't realize there was a time actually during the Golden Girls send-off when the real St. Olaf extended an invite for her to make a visit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like there's a, I don't know if I read that or if I saw it on the Netflix, like, documentary about her um, I, that I... I yeah, I think the real St. Olaf College extended an invite and they had a blast with it. And uh, that, I, oh, there was another scene. I can't remember if this was ad-libbed or not when she would go into these uh, stories, these obscure stories about what happened and her co-stars. And they kept this in. I don't know if they, they, I think they either kept this in or was this part of a blooper reel, but this made the final cut apparently where they couldn't keep from laughing. They were just, because it was just so silly and weird, they couldn't stop laughing. And they're trying to keep character and they're failing miserably and it just turned into a riot. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was definitely just a, a blooper that they kept in but anytime she goes on about her stories just know i'm i'm definitely that person that's full-on laughing and no one else finds it funny but i think it's the most funny thing about it because it's just so stupid the it's great just... herring war that's what i was thinking of and the way they're just the way they're trying to play it straight and it's clear that this whole premise is ridiculous <laughs> like oh. all, but like totally don't really exist yeah <laughs> And I'm like, all right, I have not seen as many episodes of the Golden Girls as you have, but I that was a that was a favorite because I'm like, yeah, I probably would lose it too, trying to keep a straight face in this ridiculous premise about a great herring war and shooting herrings out of a cannon. I'm like, what? Yeah, none of it makes sense. And then like anything that you think was like normal, that was weird. That was the weird part, yeah. Oh, um, well, so I guess I have to ask you, do you, uh, do you have any Golden Girls high socks as you talk about wearing them in basketball? Have you found a way to mesh the two? Unfortunately not, which is really sad, but half the socks I have gone from teammates, which is like the best gift ever. I have Golden Girls everything. Um, I have, I, I shouldn't get into it, but no, I not. <laughs> I mean, it's you could. I'm not on a time limit here. We've already gone off the rails with your destroying dreams of all these helpless defenders. It's like, we might as well just go all the way, Savannah. <laughs> well, if you really want to hear the list, I suppose it's not too long, but uh, it's okay. So I have probably like eight to 10 pairs of Golden Girl socks. I have um, a mug of the Golden Girls. I have, I used to have three t-shirts, but now I just had, I have one because I figured one was good enough. And it's a cover of a band. Oh my gosh. I, it's called like the Something Boys. Um, some like older band. Um, and then I have, um, obviously I have the Seven Seasons. Um, I used to have like, Oh, I have a car keychain of the Golden Girls. I have like 12 pins that used to be on like my, on my old backpack. Um, what else do I have? 
oh, I used to have like a Chia, a Sophia Chia um, C thing. And then I had, oh, what was it? It just came to my head and then I like knocked it off into the Sophia Chia C. Oh, I used to have like a pop figure. Um, and then I also used to have, it was like a, like a thing that I sewed of the golden girls that said like, stay golden. And then, oh, and then I have a Betty White um, edition of the people and it was after she had passed and they made like a, a magazine all about her and I have that. Oh yes, they were going to I think celebrate her 100th birthday and uh, uh, the, the timing didn't work out so well, which I guess in a weird way turned it into a collector's item. That is, that is all, yeah, that is true. Um, I think it was kind of selfish that she would pass away you know, for me, um, because I felt like she could have waited two weeks at least till it was her birthday, but I had other plans. So whatever, it's fine. Um, yeah, no, um, I'm still a little hurt about it, but it's fine. I'll, I'll move on eventually. Okay. <laughs> I don't think you're alone because she connected with a lot of generations owing to her work from her early days as a comic and a game show panelist to, you know, the Golden Girls, of course, and the Mary Tyler Moore show. She was on that show. For, she had uh, been on. And then more recently, uh, the proposal, Ryan Reynolds remembered her fondly and hot in Cleveland. And then, of course, her appearance on SNL, which inspired a lot of the female alumni to come back and participate so no I don't think you're alone with that but uh or I think someone <laughs> I forget what I think folks are having a little fun with the that she went at New Year's Eve <laughs> yeah is when she passed unfortunately and going well that I guess uh, there's <laughs> what like uh, better it's like she she picked the perfect time because now we're all <laughs> she's gonna <laughs> give us one last uh Thing. And then, of course, uh, SNL reran her hosting gig, which was like, oh, speaking of time warps, mm -hmm. like Don Pardo was still around back then. Like, holy, and several of the cast members who have now moved on to other projects. So I'm like, this feels like <laughs> we're going back in time. But uh, I do have to ask you, Savannah, I'm sure you get this a lot, but who is your favorite character from the Golden Girls? Oh, my God. Oh, that is so hard. Okay. I'm I was honest. wondering that I was wondering if you would say that. <laughs> I want to say Rose, but I feel like that's like so basic. But I would say I would I really do love Dorothy. She is definitely, I think, my favorite. And then I would go with, oh, it's so hard. You can't ask me that. But I think I have to go with Dorothy. I feel like we share a lot in common. What would you say the two of you have in common, even though your age difference is pretty significant at this point? Well, we're both tall, awesome, funny, sarcastic. Um, and <laughs> I love her humor, like just her sarcastic humor. And she's just kind of like, why would you even kind of ask that kind of thing? Um, I, lo I love that. Um, I love how she kind of is like, the mom of the group, even though her mom lives with them. I, I still feel like the, that Sophia isn't really the mom. I feel like she's kind of in her teenage years uh, with the way that she acts. But I feel like with some aspects, I love how um, I love Dorothy's personality with how just caring she is. Well, I don't know what this podcast will accomplish, uh, I, but if anyone from Illinois State is watching, uh, I've got a feeling we're going to be giving the media department a few ideas for Golden Girls style uh, skits or tie-ins with you, Savannah. I think that'd be perfect. In fact, that'd be like a dream come true. So keep that in mind, Illinois State. <clears throat> Then again, why why wait? Someone from Armstrong might be watching this or someone from CCX. <laughs> I just hope I didn't open a Pandora's box for you, Savannah, because I could see you get like another 2020 game and then someone's going to ask you about the Golden Girls. You're like, wait, uh, what? You know what? I might not mind that. So 
if you want to like design like a whole poster of the Golden Girls and I fit somewhere on that, that would be amazing. It doesn't even have to be about me. It could just be the Golden Girls. Well, you and I, I don't know. We might have to find a Golden Girls style podcast for you. And that's not really my forte, but uh, we might have to find some classic TV podcasts for you to join. I think you fit right in. And the host would be probably surprised, perplexed, and flabbergasted as to, wait, how is this teenager into all of these old shows? But it works. Exactly. Whatever your interests are. Mine just happened to be, you know, on the better side of things. Mine is fonts. <laughs> <laughs> you might learn this about me now that we've uh, introduced ourselves. I, I can recognize, actually, if you go back and I did Crystal Flint's triple threat event. And so I went through and discovered either similes or facsimiles or the, the very thing I can replicate graphic templates from sports broadcasts. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is probably the most unusual talent I think anyone in sports has where I can go and make any broadcast look like something you would see from a certain network in a certain era, all the way to the 80s. Well, you know what? That might be my dream come true, but I just don't know about others. But you know what? You met me and now you can put that talent that I've never heard of to just amazing use. Oh, I have. If you go to my YouTube channel, check out the Triple Threat events. I, I did put that to use where I think I... <laughs> And the, the funny thing is, the idea came to me because I did two all-star events and I'm going, how do I help them stand out from each other? And then I was just watching an ESPN alternate broadcast for the NBA 75th anniversary. And so they had four different eras of sports broadcasts to celebrate. And I'm like, there you go. I'm like, wait a second. I know all these fonts and typefaces and templates. It's like, I've got all of this in my head. All I got to do is just punch it up and... Uh, I think I went in too deep, but it, it, it's well known, at least in my circle, that if you have any questions about fonts or graphics, I'm your guy. Okay, now I know that. That's perfect. It, 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 I don't know how useful of a talent that is, but there are worse addictions to have. Exactly. So I don't think having a, a talent like that where you can recognize anything up until the 80s is, is that really well, that bad no no what i meant I, I should have rephrased that i can go back what i'm saying i can recognize templates going back to the 80s so anything from the 80s up to the present day mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i can recreate network templates from pretty much any era from the 80s up through now yeah that's definitely <laughs> So I'm so for the triple as an example, the triple thread event, I had one my first game I made to look like a 1980s sports broadcast. The second game I went to the 90s. The third game I did early 2000s. And then the final game, I went modern and recreated the ESPN college basketball template. Hmm. Wow. Okay. You probably won't meet anyone else who can pull that off, at least no. <laughs> not in their spare time. I, I don't, I definitely, I no. If I haven't met one already, I definitely don't think it's going to happen. You, you probably have a more, uh, a more recognizable interest in watching the Golden Girls than, <laughs> I think more people can relate to that. Then, yeah. yeah. I designed, I, I designed graphics. <laughs> I research fonts. <laughs> That yeah, probably exp what were you gonna say or? across someone else who does i mean it could happen it's a lot of people on this planet i i think you'd have better odds than i do <laughs> uh but it's become something of a running joke in my circles but it's like hey you know that i i work in television that's kind of cool it's like hey what would i have to do to design all of this and so I'm hoping that maybe one day someone will notice and be like, hey, how did you pull this off and give me a call and bring me on to whatever some big wig broadcast, because I don't know if I'm going to make it as a broadcaster or not, but uh, you can never have too many folks running graphics. Exactly, exactly.
what was I going to say before we went into this tangent about this, uh, about this whole thing? Well, something else I like to ask of my guest, Savannah, and feel free to answer this any way you see fit up to this point. And you can include this conversation with me. What would you say is the most exciting moment and your most embarrassing moment? A most exciting moment? Um, as an athlete, I should clarify, as an athlete. Okay, that was like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, was, well, definitely receiving D1 offers, but definitely from Illinois City, because that's the one that I knew I always wanted. And I was so happy once when I got it. I don't know why I waited so long to commit, but I'm glad I finally did. Um, my most embarrassing moment is probably really anytime I fall as an athlete, but one time it was last summer, um, I fell and then I was running to get up and I just fell again. Um, I, I was getting up too fast and what I can handle and going too low and I just literally just fell and I was trying to get back on defense. If it would have been offense, my team is fine. But on defense, I was like, I gotta get back. And then I just fell again and I wasted more time. But they didn't score. And I think, if I remember correctly, I managed to get a rebound. So that's all that matters. And that reminds me, Savannah, how many offers did you receive? When did you get your first one? And how surreal was that process? You know, thinking that, okay, I'm not famous enough. And then you find out, well, you don't have to be famous to get recognized or to get offers from coaches. Um, well, I had seven offers and my first one was in October. Um, I started speaking to Mon was it September? I might have been September, but I want to say October. I was speaking to Montana State. I had spoken to the assistant coach. And then the, two days later, I spoke to the head coach and she had given me an offer. And that was, I literally went down screaming to my parents and crying out because it was insane. Like I didn't, I didn't know how it was supposed to work or anything like that. Um, and no one in my family had experience with that. So we were all like thinking, wait, really? Like did that just like happened and so happy and the next day, my mom ordered a Montana State sweatshirt, so <laughs> she was she was really happy too. But um, that aged was, well. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I guess you know, you, you can still hang. You, you just don't want to wear it at Illinois State games, is what I'm saying. But it's like uh, that. Yeah, like uh, all right, you've got an extra sweatshirt, I guess. Yeah, you know, I have a friend who's thinking about going to Illinois State for call or not Illinois State. Montana State for college. So I might just give a sweatshirt to her if she just decides to go there. Well, yes, let this be a lesson. I think we said this before. You don't have to be famous and you're not the first. I know of some athletes who played for teams that didn't make much of a run. You know, they weren't on the short list of candidates for state, but they still got offers. They still got a chance to play. So I hope if nothing else, Savannah, you take from that story, you, from your story is that if you're good enough, people will notice. And, and I guess if you get any more offers or things down the road, uh, just I, I can see your mother adjusting her wardrobe almost instantly. It sounds like if you were to say, go from Illinois State to another school, the next day she'll have a sweatshirt of whatever school you're representing. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Well, as crazy as this might sound, Savannah, is there anything else about your journey or your story in basketball or elsewhere that you'd like to share with us? Um, not, not that I can think of. I'm just grateful for every opportunity that I've I've had to play. Not everyone even really gets to also just play AAU. Um, and I'm a big believer in playing AAU is how you grow also as a player. Um, but I will say the most crazy thing that's happened to me um, this year in AAU was my coach, Blake, my bestie, he left and he went to go do bigger, better things. 
and Coach D won with his wife, which is fine, even though he left me, it's fine. But I, he was definitely just one of the best coaches I've ever had, and we all miss him a lot. Um, but we were that that was crazy just because we weren't expecting it. But he was a really good coach, and Fairfield Go Stags is getting a really good coach. But that was probably the most crazy thing that's ever happened because it was just like, oh, like we just found out randomly, and no one was really ever expecting it. But yeah. That does lead me to wonder how awkward would it get if uh, Illinois State, I don't know how, who controls scheduling, but say they get Fairfield in a game. <laughs> what would happen there? Um, anytime I score anything, I'm just going to give them the death stare. Um, anytime anything happens, I'll give them the death stare, really. Um, but Illinois State and Fairfield are, or well, with my coach, they're really good. They're really good friends and all that. So they're like best buddies, according, according to him. So he was, when I told him that I was going to Illinois State, he was really happy for me and all that and excited. And um, yeah, I think, I don't think it'd be too awkward besides the fact that like, you know, I'm just going to give him the death stare and all of his teammates are probably going to think, well, why does why does she hate you? And he'll be like, it's mutual. Maybe it's not. We'll find out. All I'd have to say is uh, watch out for that brick wall. Exactly. Exactly. It's going to destroy you. I have no idea what impression my viewers are going to get or my listeners, or whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, I've got a feeling they're probably not going to sure what, well, they're not going to sure what to make of me. Uh, you they probably figured out they're probably gonna wonder what's wrong with this guy <laughs> <sighs> no you know what that's that's what keeps people intrigued it's like what the heck and that's just what keeps people intrigued so as long as i think we both got that going for us good things are going to happen <laughs> well i am known for diving into random pop culture trivia nuggets on my broadcast so if you go back and watch some of my games i usually find something obscure or something nerdy to throw in whether it's an all-star game or uh, oh with Nuno Aguera going to Stanford I went into this uh, diatribe on other athletes of Nigerian lineage who went to Stanford so yeah if I get a chance now that I know about you a at least a little more now that you're on my radar so to speak I'm like I'm gonna have to dig up some Golden Girls factoids and see if Savannah recognizes them. Uh, because uh, there are a few that I've learned about over the years because I'll just punch up Wikipedia or, or some other articles, uh, kind of get, get into the backstory on how some of these uh, successful programs or shows came to be. So I'll have to see if I can slip one past you. I, that might be hard, but that's going to be my goal. <laughs> perfect i'll be prepared maybe not we'll find out but i do enjoy this conversation and i do look forward to seeing you back out there i do remember seeing you uh, last year with blake's team in aau and of course uh, with kennedy sanders leading the way she kind of took the lead on that team but you know, you've got some other athletes there. Zoe Washington is going to St. Thomas. Bryn Beeford, who uh, was excited to see uh, you come on. Uh, I, I dread to think what might happen if the two of you were to go against each other in high school, uh, because uh, it'd be the battle of brick walls. <laughs> Man, going up against beef is like the hardest thing ever. It's all love, but I'm like, oh my god, like I. Ugh. We get into it in the best way possible, but we understand it. I, I love her. So. I'd like to think that's where you learn to become such a strong, impenetrable brick wall is from beef. Um. Yeah, and having to go up against her, I found out that she loved it. I hated it personally. <laughs> so, especially because her team would always win. So I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I just, oh, it would drive me insane. But no, she's a super awesome person. I'm thinking for her, she loves it because finally someone who's my size. <laughs> Literally, me and my mom going, oh, my God, Ugh, why? Why this game? Why Why now during state? But 
like I said, she, yeah, no, she, she loves it. And I am glad that I get to um, play against her in practice. Yeah, it's like, finally, I could pick on someone my own size. <laughs> Literally. I'm having way too much fun with this, but no, it was, it, it was a lot of fun just to learn a little bit about you. And like I said, now I'm excited to see uh, what AAU is going to look like. I know you'll have a different coach now uh, because, well, when, when Blake's wife gets an offer to be the head coach at a D1 school, it, it's kind of hard to pass up. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that being, being the supportive husband that he is, uh, it made sense that he would move with because, you know, Hey, your wife gets a, a chance of a lifetime. So, I think it's an understandable move. And like you said, now you can give him death stares every time you score against uh, Fairfield if that comes up. But like I said, if nothing else, it puts you on my radar. So now I'm going to have to find a way to get to an Armstrong game and see if you really are all that. No, I'm tease. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Anyways. See if you really are at, at, at what they make you out to be. It's like, yeah, let's see if this double double, let's see if she's legit or if this is all just a, a mirage if i don't get 30 30 it's not good enough so <laughs> okay I, my bar's not that high because you know even 20 20 is uh is pretty hard to do so i'm not that stingy you know I, i'll if you get a double double i'll let it slide okay that's okay. the standard yeah. double double and i'll be fine no i i'm uh excited well and that's why i do podcasts like this to give athletes who maybe have been in headlines and those who haven't a chance to talk about themselves and be a reminder to the audience that hey these athletes are much more than their stat lines and their records suggest but yeah you're gonna have to send me the schedule savannah or at least put in a word with your coach because i have to figure out how to fit an armstrong game into the schedule for next season i got you don't worry got you well, Savannah, I do appreciate the time and I look forward to seeing what you can do in AAU and how that will carry over to this next high school season. It sounds like you already are experiencing the bittersweet vibes, but I have a sense you're going to have a lot of fun now that your college commitment is out of the way. That's one less thing you have to worry about as you get out there and show everyone what you can do. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I appreciate it. Once again, Savannah McGowan, uh, Robbinsdale Armstrong, soon to be a Redbird at Illinois State. And as she noted, you can see her throughout the spring and summer on the AAU circuit. State is coming up, so that will be a great opportunity to see her play. And I know there will be plenty other uh, tournaments you can find her in. And that goes for anyone else if you want to check them out on Fury as well. And if you'd like to check out this podcast or be a guest for an upcoming episode, just contact us at tsbtelevision at gmail.com or at the Mike Peden on social media. If you've got a story, we'd be happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching.